Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter Seventeen D, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. What did the second drawer contain? Documents, the birth certificate of Leopold Paula Bloom, an endowment assurance policy of five hundred pounds in the Scottish Widows Assurance Society, intestated Millicent Millie Bloom coming into force at twenty-five years as with profit policy of four hundred and thirty pounds four hundred and sixty two pounds ten shillings and five hundred pounds at sixty years or death sixty-five years or death and death respectively or with profit policy paid up of two hundred and ninety nine pounds ten shillings together with cash payment of one hundred and thirty three pounds ten shillings at option a bank passbook issued by the ulster bank college green branch showing the statement of a c for half year ending thirty one december nineteen o three balance in depositors favor eighteen pounds fourteen shillings sixpence sterling net personality Certificate of possession of nine hundred pounds. Canadian four per cent inscribed government stock, free of stamp duty. Dockets of the Catholic Cemeteries Glassenveen Committee, relative to a grave plot purchased. A local press cutting concerning change of name by deed poll. Quote the textual terms of this notice. I, Rudolf Verig, now resident at number 52 Clans Russell Street, Dublin, formerly of Zombethly, in the Kingdom of Hungary, hereby give notice that I have assumed and intend henceforth upon all occasions and at all times to be known by the name of Rudolf Bloom. What other objects relative to Rudolf Bloom, born Virag, were in the second drawer? an indistinct daguerreotype of rudolf virag and his father leopold virag executed in the year eighteen fifty two in the portrait antlier of their respectively first and second cousin stefan virag of zesfehervar hungary an ancient haggadah book in which a pair of horn-rimmed convex spectacles inserted mark the passage of thanksgiving in the ritual prayers for pesach passover a photocard of the queen's hotel ennis proprietor rudolph bloom an envelope addressed to my dear son leopold what fractions of phrases did the lecture of those five whole words invoke Tomorrow we will Tomorrow will be a week that I received. It is no use, Leopold, to be with your dear mother. That is not more to stand. To her all from me is out. Be kind to Athos, Leopold. My dear son, always of me. Das hers, got, dein. What reminiscences of a human subject suffering from progressive melancholia did these objects evoke in bloom? An old man, widower, unkempt of hair, in bed, with head covered, sighing. An infirm dog, Athos, aconite restored to by increasing doses of grains and scruples resorted to by increasing doses of grains and scruples as a palliative of recrudescent neuralgia the faith in death of a septuagenarian suicide by poison why did bloom experience a sentiment of remorse because in immature impatience he had treated with disrespect certain beliefs and practices as the prohibition of the use of flesh meat and milk in one meal the hebdomadary symposium of incoordinately abstract perfervidly concrete mercantile co ex religionist ex compatriots the circumstances of male infants the supernatural character of Judaic scripture, 
the ineffability of the tetragrammaton, the sanctity of the Sabbath. How did these beliefs and practices now appear to him? None more rational than they had then appeared, not less rational than other beliefs and practices now appeared. What first reminiscence had he of Rudolf Bloom, deceased? Rudolf Bloom, deceased, narrated to his son Leopold Bloom, aged six, a retrospective arrangement of migrations and settlements in and between Dublin, London, Florence, Milan, Vienna, Budapest, Zombathli, with statements of satisfaction his grandfather having seen Maria Theresa, Empress of Austria, Queen of Hungary. With commercial advice, having taken care of pence, the pounds have taken care of themselves. Leopold Bloom, aged six, had accompanied these narrations by constant consultation had accompanied these narrations by constant consultation of a geographical map of Europe, political, and by suggestions for the establishment of affiliated business premises in the various centers mentioned. Had time equally but differently obliterated the memory of these migrations in narrator and listener? In narrator, by the excess of years and in consequence of the use of narcotic toxin, in listener by the access of years in consequence of the action of distraction upon vicarious experiences. What idiosyncrasies of the narrator were concomitant products of amnesia? Occasionally he ate without having previously removed his hat. Occasionally he drank voraciously the juice of gooseberry fool from an inclined plate. Occasionally he removed from his lips the traces of food by means of lacerated envelope or other accessible fragment of paper. What two phenomena of sentence were more frequent? The myopic digital calculation of coins, eructation consequent upon repletion. What object offered partial consolidation for these reminiscences? the endowment policy, the bank passport, the certificate of the possession of scrip. Reduce Bloom by cross-multiplication of reverses of fortune, from which these supports protected him, and by elimination of all positive values to a negligible negative, irrational, unreal quantity, successively in descending helotic order. Poverty that of the outdoor hawker of imitation jewelry, the dun for the recovery of bad and doubtful debts, the poor rate and deputy cess collector, mendicancy, that of the fraudulent bankrupt and with negligible assets paying one shilling four pence, in the pound sandwich man, distributor of throwaways, nocturnal vagrant, insinuating sycophant, maimed sailor, blind stripling, superannuated bailiff's man, mar feast, lick plate, spoil sport, pick thank, eccentric public laughingstock seated on bench of public park under discarded perforated umbrella, destitution, the inmate of old man's house, royal hospital, Kilmainham, the inmate of Simpson's hospital for reduced but respectable men, permanently disabled by gout or want of sight, nadir of misery, the aged, impotent, disenfranchised, rate-supported, moribund, lunatic pauper, with which attendant indignities, the unsympathetic indifference of previously amiable females, the contempt of muscular males, the acceptance of fragments of bread, the simulated ignorance of casual acquaintances, the latration of illegitimate unlicensed vagabond dogs, the infantile discharge of decomposed vegetable missiles, worth little or nothing, nothing or less than nothing. By what could such a situation be precluded? By decease, change of state. By departure, change of place. Which, preferably? The latter, by the line of least resistance. 
what considerations render departure not entirely undesirable? Constant cohabitation, impending mutual toleration of personal defects, the habit of independent purchase increasingly cultivated, the necessity to counteract by impermanent sojourn the permanence of arrest. What considerations rendered departure not rational? The parties concerned, uniting, had increased and multiplied, which being done, offspring produced and educed to maturity, the parties, if not disunited, were obliged to reunite for increase and multiplication, which was absurd. To form by reunion the original couple of uniting parties, which was impossible. What considerations rendered departure desirable? The attractive character of certain localities in Ireland and abroad, as represented in general geographic maps of polychrome design, or in special ordnance survey charts by employment of scale numerals and hatchers. In Ireland, the cliffs of Moher, the windy wilds of Connemara, Loch Ney with submerged petrified city, the Giant's Causeway, Fort Camden and Fort Carlisle, the Golden Vale of Tipperary, the Islands of Rann, the Pastures of Royal Meath, Bridget's Elm in Kildare, the Queen's Island Shipyard in Belfast, the Salmon Leap, the Lakes of Killarney. Abroad, Ceylon, with Spice Garden supplying tea to Thomas Kiernan, agent for Pulbrook, Robertson and Company, to Mincing Lane, London, E.C., 5 Dame Street, Dublin. Jerusalem, the Holy City, with Mosque of Omar and Gate of Damascus, Goal of Aspiration. The Straits of Gibraltar, the unique birthplace of Marion Tweedy. The Parthenon, containing statues of nude Grecian divinities. The Wall Street Money Market, which controlled international finance. The Plaza de Toros at La Linea, Spain, where O'Hara of the Camerons had slain the bull. Niagara, over which no human being had passed with impunity. The land of the Eskimos, eaters of soap. The forbidden country of Tibet, from which no traveler returns. The Bay of Naples, to see which was to die. The Dead Sea. Under what guidance, following what signs? At sea, Septen Trional, by night the Pole Star, located at the point of intersection of the right line from Beta to Alpha in Ursa Major, produced and divided externally at Omega, and the hypotenuse of the right-angled triangle formed by the line Alpha Omega, so produced, and the line Alpha Delta of Ursa Major. On land, meridional, a bispherical moon, revealed in imperfect varying phases of lunation, through the posterior interstice of the imperfectly occluded skirt of a carnose negligent pernambulating female, a pillar of the cloud by day. What public advertisement would divulge the oculation of the departed? Five pounds reward, lost, stolen, or strayed from his residence, 7 Eccles Street, missing gent about 40, answering to the name of Bloom, Leopold Poldy, height 5 feet 9.5 inches, full build, olive complexion, may have since grown a beard, when last seen was wearing a black suit. Above sum will be paid for information leading to his discovery. What universal binomial denominations would be his as entity and non-entity? Assumed by any or known to none. Every man or no man. What tributes his? Honor and gifts of strangers, the friends of every man. A nymph immortal beauty the bride of no man. Would the departed never nowhere know how reappear? 
ever would he wander self-compelled to the extreme limit of his cometary orbit beyond the fixed stars and variable suns and telescopic planets astronomical waifs and strays to the extreme boundary of space passing from land to land among peoples amid events somewhere imperceptible he would hear and somehow reluctantly sun compelled obey the summons of recall whence disappearing from the constellation of the northern crown he would somehow reappear reborn above delta in the constellation of cassiopeia after incalculable eons of perigyrination return an estranged avenger a wrecker of justice on malefactors a dark crusader a sleeper awakened with financial resources by supposition surpassing those of rothschild or the silver king what would render such return irrational an unsatisfactory equation between an exodus and return in time through reversible space and an exodus and return in space through irreversible time what play of forces induced inertia rendered departure undesirable the lateness of the hour rendering procrastinatory, the obscurity of the night rendering invisible, the uncertainty of thoroughfares rendering perilous, the necessity for repose obviating movement, the proximity of an occupied bed obviating research, the anticipation of warmth human, tempered with coolness linen, obviating desire and rendering desirable, the state of Narcissus, sound without echo, desired desire. What advantages were possessed by an occupied as distinct from an unoccupied bed? The removal of nocturnal solitude, the superior quality of human, mature female, to inhuman, hot water jar, calification, the stimulation of matutinal contact, the economy of mangling done on the premises in the case of trousers accurately folded and placed lengthwise between the spring mattress striped and the woolen mattress biscuit section what past consecutive causes before rising pre-apprehended of accumulated fatigue did bloom before rising silently recapitulate the preparation of breakfast burnt offering intestinal congestion and premeditative defecation holy of holies the bath right of john the funeral right of samuel the advertisement of alexander keys orum and thummim the unsubstantial lunch the right of melchisedec the visit to museum and natural library holy place the book hunt along bedford row merchant's arch wellington quay simach torah the music in the ormond hotel shira shiram the altercation with a truculent troglodyte in bernard kiernan's premises holocaust a blank period of time including a car drive a visit to a house of mourning a leave-taking wilderness the eroticism produced by feminine exhibitionism right of onan the prolonged delivery of mrs minor purefoy heave offering the visit to the disorderly house of mrs bella cohen eighty two tyrone street lower and subsequent brawl and chance medley in beaver street armageddon nocturnal preambulation to and from the cabman shelter butt bridge atonement what self-imposed enigma did bloom about to rise in order to go so as to conclude lest he should not conclude involuntarily apprehend the cause of a brief sharp unforeseen heard loud lone crack emitted by the insentient material of a strain-veined timber-table what self-involved enigma did bloom risen going gathering multiform multitudinous garments voluntarily apprehending not comprehend who is 
Macintosh. What self-evident enigma pondered with the zultery constancy during thirty years did bloom now, having affected natural obscurity by the extinction of artificial light, silently, suddenly comprehend? Where was Moses when the candle went out? What imperfections in a perfect day did Bloom, walking, charged with collecting articles of recent divested male-wearing apparel, silently, successively enumerate? A provisional failure to obtain renewal of an advertisement, to obtain a certain quantity of tea from Thomas Kiernan, agent for Pulbrook, Robertson and Company, 5 Dame Street, Dublin, and 2 Mincing Lane, London, E.C. To certify the presence or absence of posterior rectal orifice in the case of Hellenic female divinities to obtain admission, gratuitous or paid, to the performance of Leah by Bandmaster Palmer at the Gaiety Theatre, 46, 47, 48, 49, South King Street. What impression of an absent face did Bloom, arrested, silently recall? The face of her father, the late Major Brian Cooper Tweedy, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, of Gibraltar and Rio Bath, Dolphin's Barn. What recurrent impressions of the same were possible by hypotheses? Retreating at the terminus of the Great Northern Railway, Ammon Street, with constant uniform acceleration, along parallel lines reproduced from infinity, with constant uniform retardation, at the terminus of the Great Northern Railway, Ammon Street, returning. What miscellaneous effects of female personal wearing apparel were perceived by him? A pair of new, inodorous, half-silk black ladies' hose, a pair of new violet garters, a pair of outsized ladies' drawers of India mull, cut on generous lines, redolent of apopanax, jessamine, and Marathi's Turkish cigarettes, and containing a long, brief steel safety pin, faulted curvy linear, a camisole of batiste with thin lace border, an accordion underskirt of blue silk moret, all these objects being disposed irregularly on the top of a rectangular trunk, quadruple battened, having capped corners with multicolored labels, initially on its foreside in white lettering, B. C. T. Brian Cooper Tweedy. What impersonal objects were perceived? A commode, one leg fractured, totally covered by square cretonne cutting, apple design, in which rested ladies' black straw hat, orange keyed ware, brought of Henry Price, basket, fancy goods, chinaware and ironmongery manufacture, disposed irregularly on the washstand and floor, and consisting of basin, soap dish, and brush tray on the washstand together pitcher and night article on the floor separate. Bloom's axe. Bloom's axe. He deposited the articles of clothing on a chair, removing his remaining articles of clothing, took from beneath the bolster at the head of the bed a folded long white nightshirt, inserted his head and arms into the proper apertures of the nightshirt, removing a pillow from the head to the foot of the bed, prepared the bed linen accordingly, and entered the bed. How? with circumspection, as invariably when entering an abode, his own or not his own, with solicitude, the snake-spiral springs of the mattress being old, the brass quoits and pendant viper radii loose and tremulous, under the stress and strain, prudently, as entering a lair or ambush of lust or adders, lightly, the least to disturb reverently, the bed of conception and of birth, of consummation of marriage, and of breach of consummation of marriage, and breach of marriage, of sleep, and of death. What did his limbs, when gradually extended, encounter? New clean bed linen, 
additional odors the presence of a human form female hers the imprint of a human form male not his some crumbs some flakes of potted meat recooked which he removed if he had smiled why would he have smiled to reflect that each one who enters imagines himself to be the first to enter whereas he is always the last of a preceding series if the first of a succeeding one each imagining himself to be first last only and alone whereas he is neither first nor last nor only nor alone in a series of originating in and repeatedly to infinity what preceding series assuming mulvey to be the first term of his series penrose bartel d'arcy the professor goodwin julius matinansky john henry menton father bernard corrigan a farmer at the royal dublin society's horse show maggot o'reilly matthew dillon valentine blake dillon lord mayor of dublin christopher callanan lenahan an italian organ grinder an unknown gentleman in the gaiety theatre benjamin dollard simon dedalus andrew, andrew pisser burke joseph cuffey wisdom healy alderman john hooper dr francis brady father sebastian of mount argus a bootblack at the general post office hugh e blazes boylan and so each and so on to no last term what were his reflections concerning the last members of this series and late occupant of the bed reflections on his vigor a bounder corporal proposition a bill sticker commercial ability a bester impressionability a boaster why for the observer impressionability in addition to rigor corporal proportion and commercial ability because he had observed with augmenting frequency in the preceding members of the same series the same concupiscence inflammably transmitted first with alarm then with understanding then with desire and finally with fatigue with alternating symptoms of epicene comprehension and apprehension with what antagonistic sentiments were his subsequent reflections affected envy jealousy abdignation equanimity envy of a boldly and mental male organism specially adapted for the superincumbent posture of energetic human copulation and energetic piston and cylinder movement necessary for the complete satisfaction of a constant but not acute concupiscence resident in a bodily and mentally female organism passive but not obtuse jealousy because a nature full and violet in its free state was alternately the agent and reagent of attraction because attraction between agents and reagents at all instants varied with inverse proportion of increase and decrease with incessant circular extension and radial re-entrance with incessant circular extension and radial re-entrance because the controlled contemplation of the fluctuation of attraction produced if desired if desired a fluctuation of pleasure abdignation in virtue of a acquaintance initiated in september nineteen o three in the establishment of george messias merchant tailor and outfitter five eden quay b hospitality extended and received in kind reciprocated and reapportioned in person c comparative youth subject to impulses of ambition and magnanimity collegial altruism and amorous egoism d extra-racial attraction intra-racial inhibition superracial prerogative e an eminent provincial musical tour common current expenses net proceeds divided 
equanimity as as natural as any and every natural act of a nature expressed or understood executed in natured nature by natural creatures in accordance with his her and their natured natures of dissimilar similarity as not so calamitous as a cataclysmic annihilation of the planet in consequence of a collision with a dark sun as less reprehensible than theft highway robbery cruelty to children and animals obtaining money under false pretenses forgery embezzlement misappropriation of public money betrayal of public trust malingering mayhem corruption of minors criminal libel blackmail contempt of court arson treason felony mutiny on the high seas trespass burglary jail-breaking practice of unnatural vice desertion from armed forces in the field perjury poaching usury intelligence with the king's enemies impersonation criminal assault manslaughter willful and premeditated murder as not more abnormal than all other parallel processes of adaptation to altered conditions of existence resulting in a reciprocal equilibrium between the bodily organism and its attendant circumstances foods beverages acquired habits indulged inclinations significant disease as more than inevitable irreparable why more abnegation than jealousy less envy than equanimity from outrage matrimony to out from outrage matrimony to outrage adultery there arose naught but outrage copulation yet the matrimonial violator of the matrimonially violated had not been outraged by the adulterous violator of the adulterously violated what retribution if any assassination never as two wrongs did not make one right duel by combat no divorce not now exposure by mechanical artifice automatic bed or individual testimony concealed ocular witness not yet suit for damages by legal influence or simulation of assault with evidence of injury sustained self-inflicted not impossibly hush money by moral influence possible if any positively connivance introduction of emulation material a prosperous rival agent of publicity moral a successful rival agent of intimacy deprecation alienation humiliation separation protracting separation protecting the one separated from the other protecting the separator from both by what reflections did he a conscious reactor against the void of incertitude justify to himself his sentiments the preordained frangibility of the hymen the presupposed intangibility of the thing in itself the incongruity and disproportion between the self-prolonging tension of the thing proposed to be done and the self-abbreviating relaxation of the thing done the fallaciously inferred debility of the female the mascularity of the male the variations of the ethical codes the natural grammatical transition by inversion involving no alteration of sense of an the variations of ethical codes the natural grammatical transition by inversion involving no alteration of sense of an aorist preterite proposition parsed as masculine subject monosyllabic onomatopoetic transitive verb with direct feminine object from the active voice into its correlative aorist preterite proposition parsed as feminine subject auxiliary verb and quasi monosyllabic onomatopoetic past participle with complementary masculine agent in the passive voice the continued product of seminators by generation the continual production of semen by distillation the futility of triumph or protest or vindication 
the inanity of extolled virtue, the lethargy of nascent matter, the apathy of the stars. In what final satisfaction did these antagonistic sentiments and reflections, reduced to their simplest forms, converge? Satisfaction at the ubiquity in eastern and western terrestrial hemispheres, in all habitable lands and islands explored or unexplored, the land of the midnight sun, the islands of the blessed, the isles of Greece, the land of promise of adipose anterior and posterior female hemispheres, redolent of milk and honey, and of excretory sanguine and seminal warmth, reminiscent of secular families of curves of amplitude, insusceptible of moods, of impression or contrarieties of expression, expressed of mute immutable mature animality. The visible signs of anti-satisfaction an approximate erection, a salicious aversion, a gradual elevation, a tentative, a tentative revelation, a silent contemplation. Then he kissed the plump, mellow, yellow, smellow melons of her rump on each plump, melonious hemisphere in their mellow, yellow furrow with obscure, prolonged, provocative, melon melonous osculation. The visible signs of post-satisfaction, a silent contemplation, a tentative velation, a gradual abasement, a solicitous aversion, a proximate erection. What followed this silent action? Somnolent invocation, less somnolent recognition, incipient excitation, catechetical interrogation. With what modifications did the narrator reply to this interrogation? Negative. He omitted to mention the clandestine correspondence between Martha Clifford and Henry Flower, the public altercation at, in, and in the vicinity of the licensed premise of Bernard Kiernan and Company Limited, 8, 9, and 10 Little Britain Street, the erotic provocation and response thereto caused by the exhibitionism of Gertrude, Gertie, surname unknown. Positive. He included mention of a performance by Mrs. Bandman Palmer of Leah at the Gaiety Theatre, 4647-4849 South King Street, an invitation to supper at Winans Murphy's Hotel, 3536 and 37 Lower Abbey Street, a volume of Peckhaminous Pornographical Tendency entitled Sweets of Sin, a temporary concussion caused by a falsely calculated movement in the course of a post-senal gymnastic display, the victim, since completely recovered, being Stephen Dedalus, professor and author, eldest living son of Simon Dedalus, of no fixed occupation, an aeronautical feat executed by him, narrator, in the presence of a witness, the professor and author aforesaid, with promptitude of decision and gymnastic flexibility. Was the narration otherwise unaltered by modifications? Absolutely. Which event or person emerged as the salient point of his narration? Stephen Dedalus, professor and author. What limitations of activity and inhibitions of conjugal rights were perceived by listener and narrator concerning themselves during the course of this intermittent and increasingly more laconic narration? By the listener, a limitation of fertility inasmuch as marriage had been celebrated one calendar month after the 18th anniversary of her birth, 8 September, 1870, viz., 8 October, and consummated on the same date with female issue born 15th June 1889, having been anticipatorily consummated on the 10th September of the same year, and complete carnal intercourse, with ejaculation of semen within the natural female organ, having last taken place five weeks previously, viz. 27 November 1893, to the birth on 29 December 
December 1893 of second and only male issue, deceased 9 January 1894, aged 11 days. There remained a period of 10 years, 5 months, and 18 days, during which carnal intercourse had been incomplete, without ejaculation of semen within the natural female organ. By the narrator, a limitation of activity, mental and corporal, inasmuch as complete mental intercourse between himself and the listener had not taken place since the consummation of puberty, indicated by catamedic hemorrhaging of the female issue of narrator and listener. 15 September 1903, there remained a period of nine months and one day during which, in consequence of a pre-established natural comprehension of incomprehension between the consummated female, listener, and issue, complete corporal liberty of action had been circumscribed. How? by various reiterated female interrogation concerning the masculine designation whither, the place where, the time at which, the duration for which, the object with which, in the case of temporary absences, projected or effected. What moved visibly above the listener's and the narrator's invisible thoughts? the upcast reflection of a lamp and shade, an inconsistent series of concentric circles of varying gradations of light and shadow. In what directions did listener and narrator lie? Listener southeast by east, narrator northwest by west, on the 53rd parallel of latitude north and 6th meridian of longitude west, at an angle of 45 degrees to the terrestrial equator. In what state of rest or motion? At rest, relative to themselves and to each other. In motion, being each and both carried westward, forward and reward respectively, by the proper perpetual motion of the earth through ever-changing tracks of never-changing space. In what posture? Listener. Reclined semilaterally, left, left hand under head, right leg extended in a straight line and resting on left leg flexed in the attitude of gaetellus fulfilled recumbent big with seed narrator reclined laterally left with right and left legs flexed the index finger and thumb of the right hand resting on the bridge of the nose in the attitude depicted in a snapshot photograph made by percy apjohn the child man weary the child man in the womb womb weary he rests he has traveled with Sinbad, Sinbad the, the sailor and Tinbad the tailor, tailor and Jinbad the jailer and Jinbad the whaler and Ninbad the nailer and Ninbad the failer and Ninbad the failer and Pinbad the paler and Ninbad the mailer and Hinbad the hailer and Rinbad the hinbad the hailer and Dinbad the kailer and Finbad the quailer and Linbad the yeller and Zinbad the sailor and Linbad the yeller and Zinbad the failer. When? Going to dark bed, there was a square round Sinbad the sailor's rock's ox egg in the night of the bed of all the ox of the rocks of darkened bed the bright daler. Where? End of chapter 17d. End of chapter 17. The Ithaca section of James Joyce's Ulysses. This recording is in the public domain.